In this video, we'll think of the derivative of a function as being a function in itself. We relate the graph of a function to the graph of its derivative, and we'll talk about where the derivative does not exist. We've seen that for a function f of x and a number a, the derivative of f of x at x equals a is given by this formula. But what if we let a vary? If we compute f prime of a at lots of different values of a, we can think of the derivative of f prime as itself being a function. I'm going to rewrite this definition of derivative with x in the place of a just to make it look a little more like standard function notation. So f prime as a function of x is the limit, as h goes to 0, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This isn't anything substantially different from what we've been doing before. It's just a difference in perspective. So let's do one more example of computing the derivative by hand using the definition, but at a general number x instead of a specific value. The function we're going to use is f of x equals 1 over x. And first, let's just write down the definition of derivative in general. So f prime of x is given by this formula. And using the fact that f of x is 1 over x, I can rewrite this as 1 over x plus h minus 1 over x all over h. So as usual, this is a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. If I plug in 0 for h, I'm just going to get 1 over x minus 1 over x on the numerator, which is 0. And plugging in 0 for h gives me 0 on the denominator, too. So I'll need to use some algebra to rewrite things to get in a form that I can evaluate it. Let's add together our fractions in the numerator here. The common denominator I need to use is x plus h times x. So I'll multiply this fraction by x over x and the next fraction by x plus h over x plus h. All that's over h. And now continuing, I get x minus x plus h over x plus h times x. And instead of dividing the whole thing by h here, I'll multiply by 1 over h to get the limit of x minus x minus h over x plus h times x times h. Now I can subtract off my x's here. And after I do that, I can divide my minus h by my h to get just a minus 1 on the numerator here. So that's just the limit of negative 1 over x plus h times x. And now I'm in a good position because I can plug in h equals 0 and get something that makes sense. Namely, I'm getting a limit of negative 1 over x plus 0 times x or negative 1 over x squared as my derivative. In this example, we're given the graph of a function that's supposed to represent the height of an alien spaceship above the Earth's surface. We want to graph the rate of change. The rate of change means the derivative of our function, but we're not given any equations to work with. So we'll just have to estimate the derivative based on the shape of the graph by thinking about slopes of tangent lines. I'll start by drawing a new set of axes where I can graph my derivative. And I'll consider my original function, which I'll call g of x, piece by piece. For x values between 0 and 2, my original function g of x looks like a line. It has slope negative 1 since the rise is negative 2 while the run is 2. For any point on this straight line segment, the tangent line will also be a straight line with slope negative 1. And therefore, the derivative will be negative 1 for x values between 0 and 2. I'm going to ignore the time being what happens when x is exactly 0 or exactly 2 and just look at the interval of x values between 2 and 3. Here, g of x is completely flat. So tangent lines at any of these points will have slope 0. And I'll draw a derivative of 0 when x is between 2 and 3. I'll postpone worrying about the derivative when x is exactly 3 and just think about the derivative when x is between 3 and 5, where g of x is flat again, so its tangent lines will have slopes of 0. And I'll draw again 
a derivative of 0 when x is between 3 and 5. Now things get a little more interesting. As x increases from 5 to about 7, g of x is an increasing function. The slope of tangent lines here are positive, starting at about, say, a slope of 3 and decreasing to a slope of 0 when x is 7. I can draw that down here. As x increases from 7, the tangent lines now have negative slopes, going to a maximum negative slope of about negative 1 here, and then heading towards a slope of 0 when x is just shy of 10. My estimates of 3 and negative 1 for the slopes of my tangent lines are just rough estimates based on approximating the rise over the run. As x increases from 10, the tangent line slope is positive and getting steeper and steeper, so my derivative is going to be positive and increasing. That's the basic shape of the derivative. Now let's see what happens at these special points like 2, 3, 5, and 0. To figure out the derivative at x equals 2, let's go back to the definition of derivative as the limit of the slopes of the secant lines. If I draw a secant line using a point on the left, I'll just get a line that lines up with this line and has a slope of negative 1. But if I compute the slope of a secant line using a point on the right, I'll get a slope of 0. So the limit from the left and the limit from the right of the slopes of my secant lines will be different. And so my limit does not exist and my derivative does not exist. And so I'll just draw this as an open circle at x equals 2. Next, let's look at the derivative when x equals 3. Remember that the derivative at 3 is the limit, as h goes to 0, of g of 3 plus h minus g of 3 over h. Well, if h is bigger than 0, then g of 3 plus h is going to be about a half, because 3 plus h is to the right of 3. On the other hand, if h is less than 0, g of 3 plus h is 2, because 3 plus h is actually a number less than 3. g of 3 itself is equal to 1 half, based on the filled in bubble here. And so if we calculate the limit as h goes to 0 from the positive side, we get the limit of 1 half minus 1 half over h, which is just the limit of zeros, so that's 0. On the other hand, if we compute the limit from the left, we get the limit of 2 minus a half over h, which is the limit of 3 halves over h. And as h goes to 0, that limit is negative infinity. So once again, the left limit and right limit are not equal. And so the limit of the slopes of the secant lines does not exist. And there's no derivative at x equals 3. And I'll draw an open circle there, too. At x equals 5, again, we have a corner. And by the same sort of argument, we can conclude that the derivative does not exist. And finally, when x equals 0, we can only have a limit from the right, not the left. And so by that sort of technical reason, we don't have a derivative at that left endpoint either. So we've drawn a rough graph of the rate of change of the height of our alien spaceship as it comes closer to Earth, beams down to pick up Earthlings, and then makes this escape up to the mothership. It's interesting to observe that the domain of the original function g of x is from 0 to infinity, but the domain of g prime is somewhat smaller and just goes from 0 to 2, then from 2 to 3, then from 3 to 5, and finally from 5 to infinity, missing some places where the function originally existed. 
we saw in the previous example that the derivative doesn't necessarily exist at all the x values where the original function exists. Please pause the video for a moment and try to come up with as many different ways as you can that a derivative can fail to exist at an x value x equals a. Well, one kind of boring way that a function can fail to have a derivative at x equals a is if f of x itself fails to exist at x equals a. For example, if it has a hole like in this picture. We saw in the previous example with the alien spacecraft that a derivative can fail to exist when the function turns a corner. When we tried to evaluate the derivative in that example by taking the limit of the slopes of the secant lines, the limit from the left and the limit from the right did not agree. A famous example of a function that turns a corner is the absolute value function. For the absolute value function, f prime of x is negative 1, since the slope here is negative 1, when x is less than 0, and it's positive 1 when x is greater than 0, but f prime of 0 itself does not exist. A function with a cusp also fails to have a derivative at the cusp. In the alien spaceship example, we also saw that f can fail to have a derivative at a discontinuity. But there's another way that a derivative can fail to exist, even when f has no cusp or corner or discontinuity. Let's look at the function f of x equals x to the one-third, graphed here. What's going on at x equals zero? At that instant, the tangent line is vertical, with a slope that's infinite or undefined. So the limit of the slopes of the secant lines will fail to exist because it'll be infinite. A function is called differentiable at x equals a if the derivative exists at a. A function is differentiable on an open interval if f is differentiable at every point in that interval. So all of the examples on the previous slides are examples of places where a function is not differentiable. All of these examples are important, but I'm going to focus on the example involving discontinuity. In general, if f of x is not continuous at x equals a, then f is not differentiable at x equals a. This is what we saw in the example involving the jump discontinuity. An equivalent way of saying the same thing is that f is differentiable at x equals a, then f has to be continuous at x equals a. However, if all we know is that f is continuous at x equals a, then we can't conclude anything about whether or not it's differentiable there. f may or may not be differentiable at x equals a. Remember the square root example. The square root of x is continuous at x equals 0, but it's not differentiable there because of the corner. In this video, we related the graph of a function to the graph of its derivative by thinking about the slopes of tangent lines. We also looked at several ways that a derivative can fail to exist at a point and noted that if a function is differentiable, it has to be continuous.